everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Nico Luvranos, Commercial Lead at Digital Catapult for Energy, 5G, AI, and Blockchain. And I will be hosting this forum of distinguished speakers from the UK energy sector. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and will be shared with you. So I would kindly ask you to stay muted throughout the session. Please use the chat function to share your comments or questions throughout the meeting, and then we will address them during the Q&A session. The topic of today is very close to our hearts. We will explore the opportunities that the convergence of technology and energy can bring to deliver the energy networks of 2050. In other words, we will explore the benefits stemming for intelligent energy networks to accelerate the transition to net zero. And by means of a definition, when we say intelligent energy networks, we mean, we mean networks that can make autonomous or semi-autonomous operational decisions and can provide flexible services to energy network stakeholders, whether they're internal or external, hope now and hopefully in the future. And for those that are not familiar with Digital Catapult, we are the UK authority of advanced digital technology, such as 5G, IoT, AI, immersive, blockchain, and soon, quantum technologies. Our mission is to accelerate the adoption of advanced digital technologies by industry to drive growth and opportunity for the UK economy. As an example of how we're leveraging our expertise for the benefit of the energy sector, on the energy, uh, uh, on the network innovation side, we are working with national grid, uh, gas and electricity transmission uh, on a project called 5G R to the Possible, which is the UK's first 5G feasibility study on transmission uh, networks. And we're also working with other networks on the Strategic Innovation Fund uh, program by Ofchem. And on the BEO side, we are also advising other uh, networks on uh, their draft submissions, the business plan submissions, and uh, developing and executing on their digitalization strategy. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our panel of pioneers in the space. And I will stop sharing the screen at this point. So uh, let's start with the first question. Elin, uh, for electricity networks, what are the challenges stemming from the proliferation of DERS and low carbon technologies and how in your opinion, can they be addressed with advanced digital technologies? Decarbonisation is a great opportunity. Um, certainly the lifestyles that people and communities will experience over the next decade will change drastically uh, from how customers fuel and, and choose their transport options and heat their homes. And whilst the target to net zero is clear, the pathways to get there are still uncertain. So I think it's important for us as a business at UK Power Networks, the wider energy system and wider market is to ensure that we remain a facilitator for whatever decarbonisation scenario materialises. Second of all, we embrace and enable the flexible and smart energy system. So rather than just using the, the traditional approach of building, we actually maximise network utilisation to support low carbon technologies to come online and make sure that we deliver net zero at lowest possible cost. And I think within that also stepping up our capabilities in data and also enhancing our digital culture. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, then the, I will ask the same question to, to Dr. Catherine Edwards, Senior Project Engineer from uh, Scottish Power Energy Networks. Catherine. Yeah, so essentially um, our network's never been more complex than it is now. Um, we have major interactions that no one ever expected. Um, I've worked in transmission for, for over a decade, and I think a lot of the distributed um, energy is going to cause a lot of problems, um, and it means that we're going to need monitoring of such a high level. We're going to need analysis of such a high level um, to keep on top of this, to make sure that we are able to utilise a lot of the um, energy sources and to make sure that we've got the loads right. Um, it's one of the things where even things like hybrid working, you know, we're all um, currently working or most of us are working from home. Um, a lot of the kind of standards that we we're expecting the electricity industry to go down, loads of things have changed. Um, so we're going to need to be using more intelligent solutions, more monitoring 
um, to keep tabs on what our network's doing. Um, we've got problems such as harmonics that never used to be, you know, a decade ago, if you said, oh, a transmission, you're going to really struggle with harmonics. Blue would going, no, no, they've never been a problem. They are now a major problem. Um, and it's not going to be the only problem that we're going to find as um, our network changes. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. And the same question to you, Ian Miller, Head of Innovation from Northern Power Grid. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm slightly worried now that um, I think of 10 years in the industry has been a short period of time. I've been kicking around here for 30 years, sadly. Um, I think, well, 30 years ago, we ran this system with very little information and we ran it with lots of safety margin. As we see more um, demands coming on in the shape of EVs and the shape of heat pumps, those kind of things as we transition to low carbon generation, be that um, PV on people's roofs or wind farms, solar farms, we're seeing those margins being eroded. We don't have the safety margins we used to. We need better information back. We need to be able to react to it faster. So we've, we've heard monitoring mentioned very, very much monitoring, but equally feeding that into the control systems directly and having things like um, automated responses to, mo to move load around uh, in, in real time without people being involved. I think uh, the other thing that jumps out at me is people are more dependent on electricity going forwards. Like it or not, if your car is electric, if your heating is electric, if the electric goes off, you've got a problem. Now that might be true with gas because the control system's gone down, but it wasn't true of your car in the past. So you're gonna become more dependent on electricity. We need to make sure that we up the reliability, up the dependability of the network to meet people's needs. And there are gonna be some interesting techniques around the information, around the manipulation of the information that actually start to make that possible. Great, thank you Ian. Uh, now we're gonna switch gears and look into the gas side uh, of the equation. Um, and I will direct the first question to Tom Notman, Director of Net Zero Delivery at Cadent. Uh, Tom, what in your opinion are the challenges that gas networks are facing in the transition to blending gas and, and hydrogen? And how can they be addressed with advanced digital technologies? Hi, Nico. Um, well, the danger of coming on forth and uh, being asked the uh, question forth, you've already heard a number of the, uh, the issues that we're facing as well in the, the, the previous answer. Uh, there's a lot of this is, is general kind of, we've got to get better at what we do, get a bit more uh, granularity of the network. Uh, we're effectively moving from standard definition to HD to 4K and, and through. Each, each iteration, we need to get more granular data from the way our network is performing. Um, crucially, though, for the, the journey to net zero, we're, as I think has already been mentioned, we're on a journey that uh, we know what the endpoint looks like, but we don't know the pathways we're taking. And there's many different pathways affecting us as well. Um, in terms of the, the, what we'll be transporting, we're effectively looking at um, potentially managing three different networks at the same time, uh, a natural gas network, a blended hydrogen network, and a pure hydrogen network, depending on where you are in the country and what stage of development we're at. So we're looking at the technologies that allow us to be able to jump between those different parts of the networks, be able to break existing networks down into sub networks and be able to look at um, the, the local um, situations and how we can support and work within that energy landscape that we're going to have in 2050. Uh, really difficult um, to predict the future in this one, but uh, the, we, we know there's going to be a lot, a lot to do there and it's all about getting more data and more in, more reactive responses from the, uh, the network. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, then I'll direct the question then to Corina, uh, Corina Jones, Senior Innovation Manager from National Grid Gas Transmission. Uh, Corina, again, in your opinion, challenges of transition to blending gases and hydrogen <laughs> and addressing well, them. <laughs> well, to echo Tom's comments, um, it's all about complexity. If we're looking at blends of hydrogen and methane within a network, um, especially when methane is likely to come in at one location and hydrogen is going to come in at another, how do you know what blend you've got in the network at any one point? Um, and how do you manage and monitor that? The systems we have on the network at the moment just can't cope with that. So we're going to need a whole load of new sensors um, and we're going to need a way of managing and analysing that data across the network moving forward. Great. Thanks, Corina. Uh, John, John Richardson from AGN, Head of Innovation and RIPEX. John? 
Yeah, I think I've got the, the easiest answer. Just uh, try and reiterate what Tom, Karina, and the, the rest of the guys said. I think the, the biggest challenge for us will be whether there's a whether it's done locally, whether there'll be a full transition. How practical is it? Uh, and it, it will be challenging whether that's a phased national rollout, a, a certain solutions, whether it's regional based conversion, localized hydrogen production, and, and just generally how will all this data and information be gathered, validated, and accepted. And as for how it will be addressed, you know, I think the guys mentioned that, you know, it's about getting all these low carbon technologies across all the networks in the UK to talk to each other whether that's hydrogen, solar panels, wind turbines, battery storage, heat pumps, <laughs> you know. So, and I think for us, connecting these technologies digitally will create real value. And probably, we, we probably need to take a bit of a look back because if, if you look at the performance in, in real one, there was actually some really, really good innovation projects that were delivered. And if we can take a wee look back at some of the IoT projects we worked on, some of the communication technologies that we worked on. It's about pulling all this information together and, and making sure that we're, we're, we're driving forward. And I think everyone can benefit from this, whether it's the, the, the DNOs, whether it's the gas networks, transmission guys, and just having better real-time knowledge, insights, and analysis, and it will drive better quality products and services whilst ensuring all customers are able to, to transition effectively. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, very insightful questions. Uh, switching gears now, moving on to the third question, and I will address the entire panel for this. So we talked about all the innovation, you know, looking ahead, but I want to turn to like the day to day, the current operations. So within your respective, respective remits, how could advanced digital technology address everyday operational challenges and support the networks in their digitalization journey? Uh, I'll start again with Lynn, uh, program manager of DSO Readiness from UKPN. Lynn. I think probably focusing on a, a common theme across all my, my peers in the panel is certainly we need greater visibility on our lower uh, networks. And that's certainly not only what industry sees, it's a key ask from our customers uh, across all uh, utilities that are serving customers and communities. And, and really day to day, what we're seeing the role of data, new monitoring technology is low voltage monitoring in the electricity networks. But that first needs to start with forecasting. So what you're seeing is a, a large activity around extensive modeling. You're seeing uh, network operators working with data scientists, local authorities to make sure that our models are as well informed uh, in our scenario bases. And then particularly if you, if I take you per networks as an example, we're forecasting anything between sort of 1.6 to 2.7 million electric vehicles um, out at the end of ED2. So that's a swing that we need to prepare for. And one way, rather than doing the, the traditional approach of build in terms of building extra cabling and substations, we need to be a leading disruptor and be bold and ambitious. So it's using other approaches to maximize network utilization. So advancing technologies with vendors on monitoring. The second is going beyond physical hardware and it's actually working with AI specialists and data scientists and those from the telecoms industry, harnessing the data we have, but also working with third parties uh, on third party data and how all this information can come together and provide us 100% visibility of our network. So I think we'll be moving away from just seeing measured data informing decisions. It'll be a mix of monitored and modeled. And really, in practically speaking in person, digital helps us do that. So I oversee uh, UK Per Network's LV monitoring and visibility programs. And also to roll out technology, you need to do uh, factory acceptance and site acceptance. And I think certainly uh, through the last 18 months, it's actually also using things like Zoom and Teams actually to do some of that uh, technology engagement, design work and approval. So you're also seeing the role of communications and data uh, shaping processes and framework 
really advancing that advancement in the technology readiness, uh, technology readiness levels. But then also physically when I'm on site with my teams delivering the kit and installing it, it's trying to make that process as seamless as possible. So traditionally you used to phone up the control room to commission a piece of equipment. We're also now looking at more self-serve commissioning services through digital platforms. So I'm excited to see that across the, the network space, we're embracing visibility coverage at street level where most change is happening and actually introducing digital uh, communications in support of making sure that that change and embracement of new technology happens moving forward. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, that's again very insightful. Uh, Catherine, the same question to you. The day to day is not looking ahead 2050, but maybe within this pricing period or less. Well, I mean, essentially, um, I've worked in, in transmission this whole time, and we are really good at doing monitoring. It's something that we've always done. And one of the things we've been doing much more recently is trying to apply a lot of our models, a lot of our analysis to distribution. Things where, you know, people a few years ago even were saying, oh, it's not worthwhile. It's not worth spending the money to monitor at a distribution level. And it's learning how we have these interactions, things like load management schemes, where they haven't taken into account a transmission overcurrent. So it doesn't really matter what you do at distribution. You've overloaded our transformer at transmission. We're taking the whole grid off. And things like that are going to become more and more important, where there used to be this kind of fine line between your transmission, your distribution, you deal with your little bit, and we'll deal with our bit. And we don't really interact that much. We just bill you or etc. And one of the things that's really made a difference now is that we do have these complex schemes and we need to be more visible of the entire network. Um, you know, we have had a number of, of issues where, you know, distribution schemes have ended up being taken off by transmission schemes. And it is, it's, it's trying to make sure that we take existing experience and we use that throughout the entire um, network. And, you know, we're, we're good at monitoring and we've been trying to kind of get our distribution colleagues to use similar technologies. And it is things where, you know, distributed temperature sensing, for example, allows us to do dynamic modelling of cables, increase the load when the cable's coping fine and, and reduce it when the cable's not coping fine based on temperatures. The same thing is going to end up applying at a distribution level, where previously it wasn't worth the expensive cost of, you know, IIoT things, you know, things used to be so cost heavy that it wasn't worth putting it at certain levels. And it's going to become more and more applicable at lower levels, especially when, you know, it's not, you know, as, as Ian, I think, was saying, you know, it's not just your lights going off now. It's the fact that most of us either have a gas boiler that requires electronic controls. My boiler doesn't work unless I have electricity. Um, the majority of the country are probably in the same situation. So we're going to be sitting in the dark and the cold. <laughs> um, we're not going to be able to drive our cars anywhere. So it's one of those things where, you know, we've never had it more important that the entire network is visible and works well. Um, and I think, as, as Ian had said, we've never had less of a safety mar margin either. <laughs> so we used to have this, you know, oh, it's okay. It's like Victorian times. You know, the bridge built in Victorian times. Don't worry, it'll withstand an earthquake. <laughs> it'll withstand a tsunami. It was built with a huge safety margin. One's built now, not quite so much. You know, yeah. it's a bit windy. The bridge has to close. Um, and it is, it's things like that, you know, are going to become a problem um, as we well, move forward. And they're a problem now. They're a problem day to day, and they're only going to get worse. Great. Uh, no, I hear a whole system picture there, and more monitoring and generally more data. Uh, Ian, what's your view yeah, on this? Just, just to take a slightly different view. I mean, I don't know as good as anything to be said, apart from that there are cost issues that, I mean, Catherine's already alluded to. With a number of positions on a distribution network, you have to spend less money to do the monitoring on any one of them. Um, and, and that's it as well. But just to take a slightly different tack, uh, I'd like to talk about three things, if I may, very quickly uh, uh, inside our system, on the edge of our system, and outside our system. Firstly, um, staffing and automation. There's going to be huge differences. Uh, hands up everybody who's got as many staff in their com company who are as qualified as they like them to be, and I'll point to the liars. It's going to be quick. Um, because we'd all like more better qualified staff in, in our companies and it's not going to happen. So automation is part of the route out of that. We've, we're already seeing that in design. We've, we've started to automate LB design so that a customer can actually just log onto the website, put in what they want. The machine goes and does a network design. 
a real network design. And the machine goes away, does a costing exercise, a real costing exercise, not an off the peg, hey, there you go. And then it, it gives the, the customer the, the, um, the budget quote at the moment rather than, rather, rather than something they can actually, a budget estimate rather than something they can actually accept, that will change um, in real time, as opposed to the 10 day turnaround that used to take. So it's faster, it's more accurate, and it uses less people. What's not so like the same kind of thing is going to happen in, in um, some of our operations or we talked about um, automated um, load transfer uh, as it network changes itself in, in the response to the opposing network. And uh, I think when we're talking some of the safety issues you might get with commissioning, outages generally, when you've got a man or a woman at one end, one other machine at the other end. And you Ian, take Ian, sorry, load. yeah, for some reason your, your connection has a, is a bit patchy. Uh, I don't know if oh, it's your... okay. you switch you to the to the computer mic. It maybe it's just the mic. I mean this should be and it's up on the top of this floor. Is it still going on? No, it's still going on. Um so come back to me. Come back. Okay. Okay, no worries. Uh so maybe we move and then we come back to you. So Corina, uh, now again, gas side, current progress, operationally, not 2050, but <laughs> the now and maybe in five years time. Um, so in terms of the data that we have, our assets were built 50 odd years ago. Um, so our data is in many formats. Um, some still on site in paper-based format um, and a lot of it in digital formats now, but very hard to find uh, when you want to find a, in a, a piece of data, a specific piece of data about one of the assets. Um, so obviously we've been building data lakes as I'm sure many of you have um, to store the data in um, and it, it is all there, uh, you just have to find it. So really providing insights to people um, around what they're looking at and especially the operational teams, um, when they're trying to fix an asset and they're trying to find data from an asset um, and it's stored somewhere in the data lake, how do you provide them um, access to that data very quickly, um, especially if it's a emergency or a, um, a piece of work that needs to be done very quickly? Um, how do we provide them that data as quickly as possible um, and as robustly as possible as well so they know it's the right data um, and it's been checked um, and that we're happy with what the content looks like. Um, obviously from there, uh, having all that data is great, can we get any further insights from it? So data analytics is key to us. Um, really trying to understand um, our assets now so that we can push them forward to hydrogen in the future um, and get them ready for some of those net zero gases that are on their way. Um, really understanding what our assets look like is going to be key for that. Um, it, it's extremely important to us to know that the assets are safe, the assets don't have defects, um, before we start putting um, hydrogen in that could cause hydrogen embrittlement and all sorts of other problems um, with those assets. So really having a baseline um, is, is key and, and that's really what we're working on at the moment. Uh, obviously, we're looking at some, some new technologies or the IoT sensing systems that we might need for hydrogen in the future. Um, but we also have to consider cybersecurity. We are um, an important asset in the UK um, and there are threats from other areas. Um, so cybersecurity has been really important in Rio 1 and we've done a number of projects in this space. But that has tended to try and reduce the number of sensors um, and reduce yeah. the number of areas where you could be attacked. Um, so if we want to put loads of IoT sensors in for hydrogen and because we have a more complex system, how we manage that with cybersecurity systems is, is really, really important and a problem that we haven't solved yet. Fantastic. Great insight, uh, especially on the cyber part, I think. Key thing with critical national infrastructure. Uh, Tom, over to you. Well, I'd like to take a, a slightly different approach um, on that. I'd, I'd like to claim all of the above again, uh, because all of these are uh, issues that um, uh, we're facing in terms of being able to, to gather the data in the, the, the local parts of the network. But one of the things about uh, net zero and the challenge that we face is very much this is going to be customer driven. And it is, is backed on the premise of a, a, a sea change in the way that customers uh, consume energy in the future. Um, our networks traditionally have been built around uh, uh, simpler principles than they will be in the future. 
So consequently, a lot of the attention is now in electricity on 11 kV below and medium pressure and gas and below uh, to be able to, to balance at that level. Balance points have traditionally been further up the chain, higher pressures, higher voltages. Uh, now we're going to have to be much more local to prevent local outages and local stresses on the networks. Um, and all of that comes down to changes in customer behavior and trying to predict customer behavior with a whole range of new patterns of consumption. So one of the things that uh, I think would, would certainly help all of the networks, whether you're a, a gas, electricity, or, uh, or even water network, is, is getting much more um, customer input, giving, giving customers tools to be able to provide information back to networks. We don't directly deal with customers at the moment in the, 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 the normal course of events. We, are, we tend to get data from them retrospectively, and it's some kind of delay. Um, being able to get real-time data on, on current changes in activity, uh, get customers to be able to provide us with information from their, uh, their end of the, uh, the network would be uh, hugely useful for being able to balance networks and ensure resilience going forward, particularly when you split the network into different parts and some people will be on different supplies. So I'd like to see some technologies that would allow us to uh, help customers um, provide us with data and that we could process uh, more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So things like um, VR augmented reality surveying, for example, that customers can give us information on uh, property type for conversion or on how the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the they may or may not want to adopt hydrogen versus alternative energy solutions. I'd also like to see some um, AI in, uh, enhanced um, interpretation of unstructured data like photographs. So photo interpretation and video and um, interpretation to be able to get asset data and, uh, and other enriched data from those data sources and add that to augment our own uh, existing data. Because I think it's going to be, this is going to be a customer-led revolution and we need to get closer to the customer. Uh, great, Tom, thank you. I'll quickly circle back to Ian and hope his audio problems are fixed before we move on to, to John. I'm hoping, Sorry, John. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping so too. Is that, that sound okay to you? Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So I, I talked about uh, staffing automation um, uh, and, and uh, design and network ops and things like that. I'll move on to the, the stuff that's on the edge of our network. Uh, we're looking at uh, the information that, that we can get back from smart meters and the voltage signals in particular that we can feed back into our systems through uh, a box of tricks um, for one better description um, and then back out into our operational technology systems to control the voltages on the primary substations. Now. Traditionally, we've, we've had a, a voltage band that we could um, uh, send voltages to customers in. We tended to be in the top end of the band at low voltages as you, sorry, low demands. As more demand came on, that voltage would sag away. If we can reduce the voltage, if we can reduce the voltage by, say, 4%, we'll see about a 4% reduction in energy use by the customers. So that's straight off their bills without any noticeable detriment to those customers. They won't even notice it's happened and yet they'll be paying less money and the country will be using less energy. So that's the kind of grid edge type example of where we're seeing that. We're building that as we speak. So that's, that's it will be there in the next couple of years um, and, and expect to see some, some really useful, very boring, um, but very useful savings in both energy and cost terms there and indeed in carbon terms. The final one just to mention is, is beyond the grid edge. Everyone's used Google Maps and sat navs and things like that, and they've all seen the traffic reports coming back in. Well, imagine you're in your electric vehicle cruising down the motorway, and you know you need to charge somewhere. Wouldn't it be nice if the network information and the charger information and whatever outages on the network that might affect your ability to charge or congestion on the network and, and flexibility uh, in, in use of the network actually fed back into your sat nav? And it predicted the best place for you to charge today, which motorway service station you should stop at, took into account the, the, uh, the traffic jams ahead and things like that. That's very possible. And it's about us making our data available to other people. So these aren't all about things that are in our gift. It's also going to be about things where we can just let other people play by being open about things. So I think that those are the three areas I've touched on. Instant network, edge network, and network. Great, Ian. Uh, luckily, you started, started being choppy, but it was at the end. <laughs> John, over to you uh, from the SGN point of view. Yeah, so for, for my own re respect, it, it, it spans, you know, from BAU innovation for operational efficiencies through to disruptive technologies and supporting energy system transition. So 
And I, and I think we, we again probably need to look at our performance now. We've, we've uh, from a gas networks perspective, certainly we've, we've introduced uh, robotics into the network, which has brought you know huge advantages not only to the networks but to our customers for sealing leaking joints. We've also looked at how we can uh, autonomously control pressure and, and management of pressure across our distribution networks, our low pressure networks. And it is probably about just taking those to the next stage. You know, what, what can we do with that information? What can we do with the learnings from those projects? Can we introduce artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and, and get a real benefit from that? And it, probably one that's closer at the moment is how we actually uh, manage our field force operations. You know, we've developed a platform internally called Field, which looks to leverage the power of video, voice, and text to introduce safer, more productive field force operation. It also enables our leaders and key stakeholders to know what to focus on next as far as, as, far as managing our, our field force are concerned. But again, can, can we actually take that a step further? We're looking at, uh, Tom mentioned it, ob observational data, imagery, voice, text, by our field work, uh, workers at key points as the jobs progress, and how can that be used to better inform our customers? Uh, we're also looking at taking that to the next step. Can we introduce artificial intelligence to that? Can we drive analytics, and, including risk assessments, looking at hazards and, and mitigation measures? Uh, within our, our actual field operations. And uh, the communications key, you know, all the communications will take place uh, within the platform, which ensures probably uh, deeper data analytics are possible. You know, so, and, and again, it, it, it comes down to delivering better safety for our field workers, better quality jobs and financial benefits to, to SGN and also ultimately to our customers. So just taking the learnings from previous projects, Nico, and, and, and actually striving to take it a step further by introducing new technology uh, as, as we take it on. Perfect. Thanks, John. Uh, and now more from a broader standpoint, um, uh, David Richardson, uh, who's head of innovation at GKRI Innovate UK. Uh, your view, actually, I will say future and current. So I'll probably give you <laughs> a bigger scope. Just, just to keep it, keep you on your toes, David. Thanks, Nico. And um, for people's awareness, UKRI works across all sectors, from medicines and healthcare right through to infrastructure, transport, and all sorts. Um, so, from my perspective, I think what's of increasing um, recognition is that all parts of the economy are going to have to decarbonize, and they've all got a mandate to do that now. So across all our innovation programs outside of infrastructure, we're talking manufacturing, transport, maritime, water sectors, these are all have a really top line remit to try and decarbonize their operations. That's a good thing, obviously, but the bad news is they don't understand the energy networks or the energy system at all. And there's a very important place, I think, for um, digital, technologies to help to bridge that gap, both through the data that's being provided, both from the energy networks to those kinds of sectors, but also, um, as I think Ian and John touched on earlier, knowing your customer as well. It's really about the networks providing services that don't disrupt the manufacturing operations of different sectors or allow people to live their lives in the way that they want to with transport. And really, a lot of this is going to be um, empowered by having those data flows working seamlessly between the sectors. It's part of the reason why we set up the Energy Data Task Force, and I'm sure Dan will mention the um, data request portal that the ENA have set up now. But it feels like there's an awful lot more to do about um, understanding different cu customer characterizations and really what the challenges of those other sectors are um, grappling with at the moment as well. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, David. I see yeah, the decarbonization across sectors. I mean, this is uh, big. So energy is one piece, I guess, obviously. Uh, uh, Dan Clark, uh, uh, he's the head of innovation for the Energy Networks Association. Uh, I think also a brief uh, intro of what the ENA is for people that don't know, uh, uh, and also answer the question of current and future challenges and solving them. 
done from your from your perspective, from where you sit within the ENA? Yeah, so uh, the Energy Networks Association is, uh, well, we represent the, the gas and electricity networks across uh, Great Britain and Ireland as well. And that's both at transmission and distribution level. Um, and so we offer a forum, a place where those organizations can come together uh, to discuss the challenges. Uh, in some instances, collaborate on projects and, and try to find solutions for, for those challenges. And um, I think one of the ways which I can answer your question, you know, talked about operational challenges. So coming back to the question there, if you look out of your, your window now at the, the street that you live on or out of your, your office window uh, in the car park below, and you think about all of those vehicles uh, in the drive to net zero will have to become electrified. Some may be hydrogen as well, but they'll have to be electrified over the coming decade or so. And then in addition to that, uh, with the drive for decarbonisation of heat and the government targets for 600,000 heat pumps every year, uh, to, to 2030, uh, there's going to be a huge increase in the number of low carbon technologies connecting to the network. Uh, traditionally, we've, we've not had that many uh, connections applications year by year. And, and so that's one of the, the huge operational challenges that we have within, particularly within electricity networks. And so at ENA, we're looking to help uh, digitalize that connections process and, and replace what is ultimately a, a paper form at the moment um, to support uh, connections applications. So we're doing that through a trial that uh, SPEN, Scottish Power Energy Networks, have been running so far. Um, that trial is called Identify, uh, and it will look to use uh, AI technology, image recognition technology, to identify the, uh, the assets or the hardware that's being installed. So that's both the charge point, but also what it's connecting into, what we call in the, in the networks the cutout, the fuse. So it will recognize both of those aspects. Uh, it will then determine who is installing, where on the network they're installing and, and obviously what they're installing uh, and look to generate an automated decision um, through a, a decision calculator so that the customer can, can hopefully get an automated decision and if not pass that data back to the DNO so they have all of their information at their fingertips in order to make a, a calculated decision about whether that installation can go ahead. Ultimately that's going to make it easier for installers, faster for customers and provide better data back to the DNO. So ENA is supporting that uh, as a, a project for all DNOs. So whether you're installing uh, a charge point in Inverness or a heat pump in Ipswich or some other connection asset in, in St. Ives, you use the same process, the same app, and the same platform. Fantastic. This is good. It's like going in one place, you know, build one, deploy many, which is, I think, exactly. the best approach, obviously. Uh, now we're gonna move to the next question. And this is about bringing things together, giving gas and electricity, whether it's transmission or distribution from a whole system kind of perspective. Uh, and I will address it to the entire panel again. Um, so the question is, what's the opportunity for collaboration across gas and electricity in the digitalization journey in a whole system approach? And, and I'll start with David and then Dan, just because they have this overarching remit Dan, David, obviously you have cross sectors, but I want to use just your energy hat for the moment um, to get your insights on that. Great, thanks, Nico. So um, I, I will stick with energy, but um, I will challenge the rest of the panel as well to think about this more broadly than just being the gas and electricity sectors. I think there's a danger of um, seeing the world in that lens from an energy networks perspective and really a lot of the rest of the sector and the consumer in particular doesn't see their energy usage as being gas and electricity. They see it as one whole system and they just want to get what they can out of it. So we've run a, a portfolio of whole systems projects over the last three or four years now. And they really involved a wide range of different stakeholders working together to try and come up with solutions which solved energy provision problems across heat power and transport in local areas. I'll put a link into some of them in the chat so that you can browse them. But some of the things that we learned was um, local authorities and other infrastructure owners are really important in taking a whole systems approach, particularly where you're doing planning and interacting with buildings as well, site developers, those are really important to be involved in the design of these projects and not just used as a customer at the end of it. 
um, really getting them involved right from the outset. Another thing was to have people with the regulatory and policy insights involved in them so that they could see where those changes need to be made ahead of time and ensure that those um, conversations could start happening with local or central governments so that they didn't hit a brick wall at some point in the project. Um, another one was the investment and finance community. So it, it's all very well and good coming up with something that technically works and even that people want, but if there's a barrier to financing it because it's just prohibitively expensive, then it's not going to go forward as well. And actually, we've seen some really interesting models around how your innovation in the, these business models and finance mechanisms have really been the key to unlocking um, large-scale infrastructure projects as well. And so that's my two points on that. Over to you, Dan. Dan, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, John from SGN mentioned earlier on that there are a number of innovative projects happening out there, raising uh, initiatives and solutions up the, the technology readiness levels. And, and I mentioned the, the digitalization of connections. That is a, a really good example of, of that, where, where SPEN have really pioneered this identify solution. Uh, and now we're looking through ENA to have a, a solution that can work with all of the other DNOs as well. So we really are putting that into practice. Uh, and another area we're, we're looking at as well is... Uh, We've been working with all of the GB, gas and electricity networks at transmission and distribution level to create a national energy system map. This will be a, a map of all of the network data assets, which will then be available to users to plan their potential connections or, or overlay their own data and see exactly where they might connect to the network. Um, in fact, we're launching this uh, proof of concept at our Energy Innovation Conference next week, and I'll put a link in the chat uh, shortly. But this is a, a great way in which all of the networks have come together to try and overcome some of the challenges. And those challenges aren't just technological, they're, they're legal, you know, talk about where does the liability sit uh, in terms of uh, modeling and uh, trying to come up with how we align the data in the first place. Um, there's also challenges around user access. And I think uh, Lynn mentioned earlier on cybersecurity. So we're, we're engaging with the likes of uh, CPNI and others to try and understand uh, exactly how can we surface this data in a way that, that doesn't put any of these assets at risk. Um, so yeah, th this is a, a, certainly one of those projects. And I think probably the first project where all networks have come together to try and uh, surface data, provide a service to, to customers, whether they be domestic or, or commercial customers uh, and overcome all of these data and digitalization challenges. Uh, fantastic initiative, Diane. I, mean, I applaud that because as you can see from everyone, getting access to data is a big hurdle to anything digitalization specific. So uh, I applaud the initiative and I'm looking forward to see what comes out of it. Uh, Corinne, on your side, from the gas transmission uh, perspective. Yep. So obviously, um, as gas and electricity networks, we have good funding really from Ofgem and, and other sources to to enable our collaboration across the different groups. Um, we are running an NIA project at the moment that is looking at um, developing uh, digital twin technologies. Um, and what we're actually doing there is not only working with other, other energy networks, but looking at what automotive and aerospace have done. Um, I mean, they're a lot further ahead than we are um, in that space. So how can we take the learning that they've had over the last 20 odd years um, and build that into our um, energy network digitalization programs. So um, I think funding is, is definitely something that's gonna help us collaborate moving forward um, and having that availability of that is definitely a good thing. But we really need to be looking at uh, the wider group as well, not just the energy networks um, in the UK because there is a wealth of knowledge out there that will help us uh, moving forward. Perfect, thanks for that. Uh, Tom? Um, well, the journey, the UK's journey to, to net zero uh, is very much going to be a, a geographic um, a build up, uh, in my view. I would say that the local areas will have views on how they're going to do it, and local councils, cities, towns will have views on how they're going to become net zero within a, a given time scale. So, picking up on, on David's point, it's not just about uh, energy networks doing our bit and, and going out maybe as we've traditionally done, going out to the public and saying, we know best, we're about to do this. Um, we have to work much closer together than we ever have had before with shared data. 
we have to work out how we fit into local authority plans in a given area to say our network has to be able to be at this level by then in order for them to hit their net zero target. Um, so it's not just driven by us. And it has to also be, um, we, we have to be able to collaborate across the the, uh, the different sectors so that some of the technology, particularly in, in hydrogen, is coming from the transport sector and is also coming from other parts of uh, of the world where there's, uh, there's more advanced um, hydrogen uh, implementations at the moment. We're uh, definitely uh, up there with the, the trials and the and the theory of it, but the, the implementations in some parts of the world are, are, are much more mature. So I think we have to um, take a, a, a bit more of a, a humble view in terms of our position in net zero and how we deliver it um, and understand the importance of it, but at the same time, how we fit into what everyone else is doing. Because um, it's only then that you'll, you'll, you'll get proper net zero um, deliverables uh, locally within each of the, the, the countries, each of the counties. You can't wait for the whole country to become uh, net zero in one aspect before uh, the little parts of it, uh, that uh, the aggregate of it would uh, become net zero. Uh, great, thanks Tom. Quite insightful as well, this link with uh, local authorities in a whole system view of a city planning essentially. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, it, John, uh, over to you. Yeah, it, not, not to reiterate anything that the other guys have said, but just for me, a, a key enabler going forward is, is probably the funding mechanisms, Nico. Uh, David mentioned it earlier in the Strategic Innovation Fund. I mean, we're already having uh, workshops, uh, ideation sessions. I, I know uh, some of Lynn's colleagues from UKPN, we've had a workshop with them recently uh, in relation to a SIF proposal for local area network planning. So for me, it's about utilising the enablers and, and, and those aren't just limited to SIF. You know, there's opportunities to collaborate on NIA. We're, we're also collaborating not only with, with the DNOs and the other gas networks and the transmission guys, but through other key stakeholders like Transport for London and some of the other uh, lane rental schemes that are available. We're, we're not only talking to the DNOs and the gas networks in those areas, we're doing collaborative projects with, with the other utilities, the water utilities, the telecoms. So there's, there's some fantastic opportunities that are, that are coming up in the and again, for me, collaboration in the true sense of the word is the objectives are aligned and there's an incentive there. And I, I think some of these funding mechanisms provide that now, Nico, uh, mm -hmm. where we, th those objectives and incentives are, all seem to be aligned at the moment. It's just making the most of it. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, John. Yeah, the, this SIF uh, is actually, I can say, it, uh, it's like a, it used to be, Nick, obviously, but uh, the way it's structured is much more con uh, conducive to what you're trying to achieve and de-risk that. Um, yeah. That's great. Uh, Lynn, uh, from your standpoint. So, so I think in short for the question, um, is there opportunity to collaborate? Absolutely. So collaboration and innovation is key, as you've heard from my panel peers. I think um, decarbonisation is an opportunity for all and it's for all to work together. Um, I think we've worked quite well to go beyond sectors, beyond geographies uh, and beyond the traditional thinking. And I, I, I certainly see that sustaining and must continue as we step our way through to the net zero carbon emissions target for 2050. Um, I think certainly in the collaborators that we work with at UK Power Networks and I see across others, I think most groups are represented. I, I think the large spectrum from academia, local authorities, community energy groups, um, community centres, it, it comes down to what challenge and opportunity are we trying to answer? And really collectively, really, why are we doing it? The so what? Ultimately, we need to create a, a just and fair net zero transition. We must be ambitious and ensure net zero uh, does get realised, but we ensure that we protect consumers through that journey. Um, and within that, we also create compelling propositions for customers basically to use energy when it's cheaper and greener. Um, so we really need to change the narrative. So really against unprecedented change, it's not only innovation and collaboration, it's also keeping that open dialogue. Um, I think we need to always engage, listen and respond just to the variety of customers and communities that we all collectively serve. And 
probably the three signposts in terms of if you've got an idea, please come and innovate with us. I'll, I'll stick in you keep our network specific uh, innovation idea link. Um, obviously, there's it, certainly we've got three key pillars of innovation that we focus on. And one of those pillars is future ready. And one of the clear challenge and opportunity statements within that is whole systems optimization. And that goes beyond just the energy sector. It looks at transport. It looks at consumer groups. It, it basically is a, a catch all uh, theme. Um, Obviously, second of all is the ENA Smarter Networks portal. It's a fantastic resource. Um, it's it's got the ability for you to propose ideas, but also collectively you can dig in and find out the sort of journey because uh, it's important that we learn from projects. Um, and then if something didn't work, that's a positive. That for me, that's a successful failure because we didn't know that before. Uh, so we need successful successes and we need successful failures, but bridging and building in that continually and it's great to see that continued work together at the ENA. And the third is we need to be open to collaborate with large corporates all the way to small medium enterprises to two two person bands. So also a lot of us collectively also work with the Energy Innovation Centre that also provides a very positive innovation community partnership where they provide support to small to medium businesses. So I'd say come and innovate with us. Um, I think uh, ideas are always welcome and that's what we need through this journey, everyone to have a positive imprint on, on the transition. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, Catherine, uh, from yours, so let me go inside. Whole systems view. Go. I guess the whole systems view is kind of the same problem as this we've been having, um, kind of as a transmission and, and distribution. The same applies going across um, all systems. So, you know, there's a lot of problems that, that we get at transmission, that we get at distribution, that will actually totally flow through all utilities. So you name it, whether it's gas or water, um, and I think it's really just, you know, trying to collaborate as best we can. You know, if one of us comes up with something good, shout it from the rooftops. It's something that, you know, we've quite often been really poor at as kind of a, a whole country to a certain extent of working in our little silos. And we go, oh, yeah, we've well, got this thing that works really well, but we won't tell anyone about it because, well, you know, that would become some sort of threat, um, a cybersecurity threat, for example. And I think it is one of those things where, you know, the more we work together, the more we collaborate, um, the more we kind of um, develop cyber secure um, by design, um, rather than trying to kind of retrofit it as well. Um, I think, you know, we can only do better by working together, you know, and, and finding new things. And I think kind of seeing the system as a whole system is something that that's definitely going to require to kind of get get us working together um you know it's just whether you're talking about electricity or gas we need to get something that works to keep the country moving um and i think we can definitely apply lots of things um that you know other industries do better um i think it was karina mentioned um you know looking at aerospace and things like that and it's something that we really need to kind of not be afraid of a lot of these new technologies just try them you know try and use innovation money to go, well, well, does this apply? It might not. It might be a fad. It might be that it doesn't apply to us. But, you know, one of the things that we always try to do is is kind of innovate and, and see whether something works. It might not. But, um, you know, something I was always taught um, was, you know, failure can actually be a, a good answer. You know, you can come out with a report that doesn't come out with the answer that you were expecting. Um, you know, it might be, well, we tried this. And it was an unmitigated failure. Well, do you know what? Sometimes that's as important as the successful story. It's actually just publishing to say, look, we tried this. Seemed like a good idea. It was awful. <laughs> it didn't work. And this is why it didn't work. And actually, often that is as important. Um, and we're not so good at sharing that kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, as we get into, into the kind of whole system, trying to share this stuff, trying to collaborate, I think that's going to become more important. Sometimes shouting the failures is as important as, as kind of shouting the successes. Uh, thanks for that, Catherine. Actually, um, Ian, I mean, we leave you last because you actually are very structured for this question. Right. Yes, I th I've heard some good things in there. Um, one thing I haven't heard is 
the breadth of the system. I've heard utilities mentioned, I've heard councils mentioned. I think I need to hear a temporal element. Um, what is going to be part of our system in 20, 30 years time? Because that's the timescales that we think in, in heavy utilities. Um, for, so for example, I'm thinking of the decarbonisation of rail uh, in 2035 or 2040, depending which country you live with, live in within the UK. Um, that's going to be interesting. We, yes, you can run electric catenaries all over the place. It's going to be horrifically non-cost effective. We're already talking to train manufacturers because if we don't think about that sort of thing now, we're not going to get the right answers in 20 years' time. Um, there are elements around how the generation fleet is going to change over the next 10 or 20 years. Look at when we um, will be able to harvest energy. PV and wind in particular are very, very temporal as to when they happen, but they're also seasonal as to when they happen. Look at when we use energy, that's very seasonal. So there's elements around the um, seasonality there. So the whole system is going to change. And, and for me, that question is more about, OK, in a collaborative whole systems way, how can digitalization support that rather than collaborative di digitalization per se? Uh, so I'm thinking some of that interseasonal stuff. If the gas guys are producing hydrogen from electricity, which they might be, they need to understand from information from us in the electricity world, when is there excess in particular areas of the network? When would it be a really good idea just to store it? Don't, yes, you could, yes, you could sell it or you could convert it back into electricity and sell it or whatever, but for the moment, just sit on it, store it, and when is the right time to use it? And, and those kind of bits of information are not going to be owned particularly by one organization or certainly not the organization that would like to use them. So there's going to have to be some, some exchange of ideas and information around that that feels like a different sort of digitalization going forwards. Um, and I think the, the one last thing in there is, um, you've used the word journey in the question. I like the word journey because I have no idea what the destination is. I can see some, some routes and directions and journeys that we might do down this working together. Um, they might take us to a variety of diff different destinations, but in terms of the exchange of ideas, exchange of information, um, some of it in real time and some of it not so much. And I did see somebody asking about digital twins as well. I must mention digital twins. If you'd asked me five years ago whether I thought digital twins were a good idea, I'd have laughed at you. What do we need those for? We've got models. Yeah, well, they don't, models are static. They don't give that temporal element. And as we see the evolution of flexibility and things like that, we're going to need more of that. If we, as we see heat coming into it, we're going to see, need to see more of that. So those, those digital twin type things are going to become more interesting, possibly more in the form of simulations than anything else. Um, as a digital twin of a 50 year old substation, no. As a digital twin of a network, yeah, very interested. So courses for courses and amongst that. Other than that, I can't really have very much to all the good stuff that's gone on already in that question. Well, I think, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's quite insightful. Uh, this interplay between when you don't, the temporal interplay, when you don't need it, store it, and vice versa, you know, push and pull between the two networks. Very, very interesting. Um, and now I'd like to move to, to the last question. It's more about lessons learned from the current journey, as you like the word, towards the autonomous energy networks, because we discussed about digitalization and how it helps with a lot of the skill shortages that we see in every sector. Uh, so it's more from your experience, what is that you see uh, as a lesson to avoid or, you know, something to be mindful of when you're moving towards more autonomous uh, operations within the energy networks uh, remit? Uh, and I'll start with Lynn. I think that the key thing, as we've demonstrated, at least in the last decade, and then moving forward to the next decade is ultimately embracing change, um, being humble, humble, engaged in listening to others, and certainly continue to innovate, but certainly making sure that we strive to embed innovation. I think that's been seen successfully. If I look at the work across the sector at UK Per Networks, um, I remember when I first started with the business in 2010, we were doing an in, uh, innovation projects, uh, flexible plug and play, looking at how we can uh, connect low carbon technologies faster and cheaper. 
and we've gone from creating a new commercial product to connect uh, certainly uh, new near technologies and that's now available across our networks um, so it's continuing that innovation theme and probably what I had flagged earlier is ensuring that as part of that all learnings are part of that process and, and really central to creating a autonomous network is ultimately the customer and communities have to remain central in that design preparation and creation uh, and we need to ensure that within that uh, process we're able to make sure that they input their thoughts ideas and suggestions but we also need to continue to validate have we met that expectation and we continue to strive for right performance and ultimately really to the point that Ian and others have flagged is that we also need to ensure that we open up data we certainly look at third parties to support us to look at other more compelling propositions and services for customers. Because um, I always use the Lipnis test of my, God rest my Nana, how would my Nana engage with this? How would she participate? So smart, flexible energy systems are critical. Um, we need to make these compelling propositions, but we need to think about that human discussion with another person. What are their thoughts? What is their anxiety? And how we start to make sure we address those concerns because it's for all of us to have the option to participate. And then for those that are least able, we need to keep a view as an industry, also with consumer groups and with customer feedback, if there's gaps, if there's unfair or unintended consequences, we spotlight that and look to address that timely. Because for me, success would not be net zero achieved if it's the loss of me of that not being fair for everyone to choose to be part of it. Uh, that's a great point about participation. Um, I quite like that uh, because it's everyone's gift to support us. You know, you can do all you want from the operational side of delivering services, but how individuals make the decision to participate and how we incentivize them to do so easily. So I think it's very important, very insightful. Thanks for that. Uh, Corinna. Well, I mean, as we move towards um, mixed gas flows within, within our networks, obviously the complexity becomes much greater than it currently is um, and probably too great for, for humans to manage, um, especially with all the different data points that are coming into the network. Um, obviously, control systems today are, are fairly manual um, and moving to an autonomous uh, method of controlling the network is going to be difficult. It's going to be a big change. Um, and I, th I think if I go back to what Lynn was talking about is around the particip uh, participation of those um, control room employees in moving toward automated and autonomous systems. They've got to understand it and, and want it um, at the end of the day as well. I think you will see um, automated systems. I think you will see autonomous systems. But I think at the end of the day, you will still have a person sat at the end um, saying, yes, that is the correct approach, um, not leaving it entirely to a PC, or at least in, the, in, my, in my opinion. I think maybe in the far, far future, uh, we could leave it to, to a computer. But our experiences to date show that they don't always get it right. Um, and you wouldn't want um, a PC to be making uh, that decision on its own, um, not not without a, a human involved in that system. So I hear you, it's more autonomous, but pro potentially semi-autonomous to make sure there's a human element to keep the system a check. The little robots in the machine, as we call them. <laughs> uh, uh, Tom, uh, over to you, lessons learned from you, the current journey towards autonomous uh, networks. So from perhaps Cadence perspective or generally from your experience, if that hasn't been necessarily within Caden. Um, well, the, the, the headline I'd say is we should have started about 10 years before now, um, because we're, we're, we're continually at a point where we're, 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 we're looking at, at the, the sort of 2050, like it's uh, a far off, far off place. And uh, it's, uh, it's 29 years. It's not that long ago. 1992 doesn't seem that far back. Certainly for those of us that were on the dance floor at that time, we can still remember what was in the charts. It's, um, it is a, a real challenge though. We, we've got a lot to do in this time and we have to get that interoperability working. That we can't do this in silos. So for me, the lessons learned is really about that kind of front end customer piece that I touched on earlier on. How do we get data back from customers quicker, 
in a more responsive form that allows us to, to work locally between the, 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 the gas, electricity, um, to balance the networks at the local level. How do you get the storage combined with the, uh, the, 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 on, the, the demand that's coming on? Because something's happening in, in a, a town somewhere, a city somewhere that is now a radically different demand. We don't have the, the, the extra resilience and the, 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 the security maybe that we had once. And we have a more divergent uh, set of, uh, of, of uh, use cases and demand profiles. So consequently, for me, automation is, uh, is very much key to being able to, to handle that. Uh, I would take Korean's point that I don't, I'm not convinced that a human is going to be able to balance all of this uh, in one control room. So you need a lot of this done in a kind of automatic um, form that makes these simple decisions that says, right, okay, we need we need to release hydrogen into the network now because the pressure is dropping or we need to be able to convert it to electricity to get the uh, uh, to, to support the network locally. We work, we operate just now with local um, local peaking generation for uh, a lot of the electricity networks. And that principle just has to get more, uh, more um, reactive and, and, and faster. And we have to get that, that part really is the, the world where digital twins mean that we've got to, we've got to be there. At the moment, we're, we're lucky in that sense if we've got a sort of digital second cousin twice removed. We, we need to get much better and a much closer relationship with that, uh, with that data. Uh, fantastic. Th thanks, Tom. Very insightful as well. Um, uh, John, yeah, from the north and south perspective, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I think the, the comments from Karina and Tom are, are, are very valid. And th there's actually nothing wrong we you know not going fully autonomous in the next five to ten years it, and for me it's about can, can we actually supplement with technology or digital solutions and we, we spoke about it earlier there'll be some uh, network surveys that we can fully replace with some form of digital technology but there'll be others where we can we can supplement to make it more efficient and probably just touching on a, a one or two points that people mentioned earlier about failure of previous projects. You know, sometimes those projects are a good starting point as well. Uh, Karina mentioned it earlier when we, we talk about IoT uh, sensors and comms. We, we looked at some of these projects maybe six, seven years ago where the technology wasn't quite there, but the method to get there was, was probably quite justified. Uh, there's, there's projects that we're seeing for, for some of our colleagues uh, looking at IoT sensors and even looking at 3D printing capabilities are, are, are far more advanced now than they were five, six years ago. So I've, I've said that a couple of times now, you know, maybe look at some of those failed projects that we worked on and, and get the real lessons learned. And, and obviously, if we can uh, do a wee bit of horizon scanning to see what technologies are available or what advancements there's been, I think there's, there's real lessons learned to be taken from that as well, Nico. And, and again, a lot of that information is available uh, quite readily on the Smarter Networks portal, you know, so the, the information is there. No, so I see the formation of a lessons learned project <laughs> yeah, stemming yeah, from all this. Yeah. It, could, it could make one uh, by itself. Um, uh, David, uh, maybe, maybe from your viewpoint, uh, lessons learned from also what within your remit, within UKRI, uh, what could be done better? What has worked and what hasn't on the way to this? Um, I think it depends on the subject area as well within the energy networks, because we're talking about autonomous systems for um, site monitoring. It's quite different from autonomous systems for creating dynamic markets or something like that. So, um, yeah, there's very different challenges with different areas of the system as well. But I think in general, what we've tried to do with the Strategic Innovation Fund this time around is split it into this multi-phase discovery alpha beta um, setup. And really that's to try and test some things at small scale, really evaluate your assumptions and ensure that you understand um, the nuances of the area you're working with and then scale it up progressively. And I think that's really an approach that can be mirrored with autonomous systems is at the end of the day, we are dealing with critical national infrastructure, which is of utmost importance. And you can't go um, rolling things out without them having been tested 
vigorously and ensuring that there are the right protections in place for any people who are or um, assets in fact who are participating in those trials and um, so that would be my my main message on it great thanks for that uh dan from the ena stand standpoint yeah, I mean, what can I what can I say that hasn't already been said, Nico? Kudos to you for putting together a great panel. They've covered it all pretty well already. So I guess I'll just reiterate. Uh, what, no, no, you're really not going to get away from this. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd say there are three three things that you need to do in terms of your, your lessons learned. Uh, it's about communication. So communicate with those touch points uh, to understand what concerns other stakeholders might have. Um, iterate so that you go through the cycle quickly and you can gather the learnings and then implement them into the next phase uh, and then collaborate you know if we if we work together and we share the challenges you'd be amazed at the solutions that can come up so if we collaborate together I'm, uh, I'm certain we can we can come up with the solutions that work for everybody fantastic Th thanks Dan uh, uh, Catherine from all the way firing up from Scotland. I think we have a heavy Scottish panel here from what I gather. There's, there's a thing going on with uh, Scotland and energy. <laughs> well, we're supposed to be great engineers, aren't we? You know, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, I mean, automation is one of the things where there's always been a, a kind of level of automation in a lot of things that it's trying to persuade people that it's okay. So things like, you know, protection systems that existed on the network for, for decades. We've always had things that because humans can't interact, you know, if you see a fault in the network, you're not going to be able to open the breaker fast enough as a human um, to protect our network. It has to operate in the millisecond spectrum. So we've always had things where we're quite happy to, OK, right, we've, we've, we've figured out that this works. We're happy for it to make its decisions on our behalf. And that's kind of seen as that autonomous. And it's when you add in extra levels of intelligence and it's making sure that we get that trust. And I think a lot of the times now, what we need to do is we need to do a kind of side-by-side -side system. So it's based on, well, are you happy for us to make a decision? You know, we've been happy with almost anyone who's been on a flight, for example, has been flying on autopilot. But we're happy with autopilot because there's a pilot there keeping an eye on it. Now, there's things that may happen under autopilot that there's not time to change. And um, we've had sad examples of autopilot going wrong um, with flights where they've unfortunately crashed because of it, but we still trust autopilot. And it's one of the things where, you know, it's making sure that we get systems that get it right, that we've got time to interact. And I think it's that kind of shift from, we trust certain levels of autonomy, but there is a point where as humans, we start to go, eh, I'm uncomfortable. This is it having to make too big a decision, or it's having to make a decision that, well, as a human, I can't make that decision fast enough. So I'm uncomfortable with this. And it's trying to make sure that all of these automated technologies, the intelligence, it's trying to sell it right. So it's making it so that, look, you know, we've, we've ran it alongside your network. Look at the improvements it could have made. You know, had our system that we've got, we've got these models, we've got the system running, had it been in operation, these are the decisions that we'd have made. This is the outcome. These are the decisions that you made. This is the outcome. And start to get that trust level to say, look, Sometimes it makes the wrong decision, but you know what? It was it was doing it alongside. So we can fix it, we can train it, we can change some of the ways that the rules work. But if you make it so that it made all the decisions, people automatically go, oh, well, I can't trust it. It made the wrong decision. And I think that's where we need to get into our comfort zone with these things. And I think we're gonna need a lot of standalone, well, this is what this would have done. Um, to get that level of confidence up, especially with, you know, gas networks, um, you know, I've heard a few of you discuss the fact that a lot of the gas networks are run on bits of paper and it's done in a really safety critical way. You know, these are safety critical systems. If it goes wrong, lives are at stake, whether it's electricity or whether it's gas, you need to make sure when we make these decisions, they're the right ones. And I think it really does, you know, we need to be getting to the point where we trust the automated system to make the right decision. Um, sometimes it might not be the best decision and that's why we will train it. But it's making sure that it makes the safe decision, makes a decision that as an engineer, if we had seen the same, we would have done the same. Whether it would be, oh, well, actually next time, if it done this, it would be better. Let's train it, next time it will do that. And it's just making sure that we, we kind of continue that trust exercise.
Yeah, um, you know, yeah. we don't trust, you know, an engineer has to have a, a degree. They have to have work experience. They have to have, be trained. And intelligent systems have to have the same requirements. We have to have done a level of trust. We have to do exercises. We have to have some sort of, of authentication, authorization. And I think it's trying to learn that automated systems require that backup. We're not going to be putting this in to go, oh, you're, you're just a lowly control engineer. We're replacing you with this black box. And I think it is, it's trying to reassure people that, that that's not our plan. Our plan is that there are decisions, such as protection schemes, that have to make decisions because we can't make decisions on those time domains. And it's trying to sell it from that perspective and make sure that we maintain our safety critical system to be really safe. And tongue in cheek from Tom, uh, gas networks are, run on, are not run on paper, that some processes are just paper based. It's just yeah, I mean, to, to the same extent, you could sell the same argument on transmission systems are sometimes run on bits of paper where. Oh, the we, stories I can tell. The stories I can tell. I mean, you know, sometimes <laughs> you go back to first principles. You know, we see things on the network that we have not seen before and we end up having to go back to literally pen and paper first principles we've seen this weird oscillation what on earth has caused that and i imagine that happens across the board there will always be the odd system that the only way for you to figure it out is to go back to first principles try and trace back your steps do a drawing of your network figure out where where has gone wrong um and i think it is you know i'm oversimplifying obviously but no that's fine where... that's fine it's clear i think <laughs> <laughs> Train them, it's harder as they get more complex, uh, obviously. Ian, over to yeah. you to, to synthesize. Uh, let's let's go through some of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's do some of this stuff really quickly. I think there's a difference between intelligent systems and autonomous systems. And, and I think autonom autonomous systems have existed pretty much forever on electrical systems, I'm guessing on gas systems as well. Intelligent systems less so. Some of those autonomous systems have become digital over the last 20, 30 years, and protection is a good example of that. Um, but if you were to think of one of the, the, the kind of key operating parameters of the system, there's two kind of key operating parameters of the system in my mind. One is frequency and the other is voltage. Um, the, the transmission companies looked after frequency and the distribution companies looked after voltage. And, and voltage was always done as an autonomous thing with ABE relays and, and, and lovely things like that, which were remarkably unsophisticated and remarkably good. But they, they did the job. Moving forward just off that, some of the stuff we're seeing now with AC, DC, AC conversion, and uh, thank you to the UKPN for your soft open point, I've nicked it, and we're using it in a slightly different way. And that's going to disconnect NGC's frequency from my customer's frequency because there's a DC link in between and I'm controlling the frequency there now. Hey, but NGC are still responsible for it. We have a problem there, I think, and we're going to have to see some of the um, regulation and some of the legislation catching up with what the technology and the digitalization can do. Um, and I appreciate it. I've gone into this without saying, we've heard some people talking about the kind of process of digitalization and lessons learned, and this is some of the content of the lessons learned. Um, we've also heard about um, uh, cybersecurity. I don't believe in cybersecurity. I'd love to believe in cybersecurity. I think it's cyber a bit more security than you'd have had otherwise. And reality is at some point, somebody's gonna get through, somebody's gonna brick it. And, and the, the concept that we're starting to explore now around that is um, graceful collapse. How do we accept the cyber attack and not trash the entire blinking country in the meantime? So that is, it's, a, it's about that sort of thing. Let's be honest, if I want to go and switch your house off today, it's really easy. I just find where you live and I go pull your fuse, you're off. The only difference is when everyone's got a smart meter or everyone's attached in a digital way is I can do that sat in, sat in my bedroom on a laptop. Um, so it is different, but it's actually more secure, but it's easier to do more damage. We need to find that graceful collapse and that make it just make the, the sheer logistics of it difficult. And the final thing that I will mention is something that, that Lynn mentioned, which was the customer. This industry has been far too network centric, system centric for far too long. The more we move to being, you know, really think about what, what is the customer actually going to do with this? How is it going to be easy for the customer to use? How are they going to benefit from it? Is it better performance? Is it cheaper? If it doesn't do those things for the customer, we do have to ask ourselves, what are we doing it for? And, and I think that that will always be front and center in any kind of innovation, digitalization, whole systems type approach that I take. Uh, 
Thank you, Ian. Fantastic. Uh, I think this concludes the question. So um, I'm keen to move to Q&A. And I think the main one that hasn't been asked in the, in the chat, asked by a mysterious person, HT, I don't know. There is blurring of line between, um, this, uh, let me see, blurring of line between the traditional mission critical functions, PAC, side devices, et cetera, and the newer intelligent autonomous functions. So with respect to cybersecurity, is it better to have a physical segregation between the two? I'll also that one. Yes, <laughs> that's why I'm quite keen. Tough. To you. The horse is bolted. It's gone. <laughs> um, as soon as you have a situation where you have any kind of flexibility on the system and you have aggregators in the system and you have control within people's houses or, or in people's factories feeding back through the power system and through the actual electrical quantities you're seeing on the power system, uh, back in a closed loop there and you cannot separate the systems. Um, tough, it's not happening, so learn to live with it. I'm going back to my graceful collapse. Okay, Is, unless there's any other questions, I mean, maybe if somebody hasn't thought about it, you know, feel free to type it in. Uh, but if not, uh, is there anyone from the panel that wants to make something uh, like a closing remark or something that they picked up and uh, along the line, because this is part of the whole point of this panel, is to also share the learnings between the panelists as we go along. So raise your hands, whoever wants to, to be that one. Nobody? Yeah. <laughs> Tom, go for it. I, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate the... Uh... The, the point I made earlier on that and I think it's been picked up in a, a number of other of the, um, uh, the the answers that you've had that net zero is a, a customer advocacy and a customer driven thing uh, whilst there is legislation whilst there is uh, a, a clearly a government incentive to do it it's incumbent on us all to to come up with solutions that make it easy for customers to do this and we, that means we've got to get costs down we've got to get resilience up and we've got to be able to do this whilst keeping the lights on and make sure that nobody really notices it's happening that is a really, really big ask. And I, I think that you, your, your point earlier on about collaboration between the various different um, um, parts of the, uh, the energy landscape, my challenge back would be the other way around. How can we do this without collaboration? This, this has to be something that we're all working on together in a very, very joined up way with a local, uh, a local view. So I would say that's certainly one thing from, uh, that I've taken away from today that uh, this isn't going to work by us coming up with wizard answers, it's going to have to, to happen by local local innovation, local solutions, and an awful lot of collaboration at that kind of level between gas, electricity, local authorities, and uh, transport companies and all of the other key stakeholders. Thanks, Tom. Uh, this is a very key point you also mentioned earlier, and it stuck with me, this at the local level, because it, nothing works. You're trying to do the big thing Try to boil the ocean actually it doesn't work uh, and reversely in isolation it just doesn't work again um if anyone doesn't have any questions i think we have a we can move to a, a short poll uh to get your feedback uh on on the session and you should see it on your screen easy to click 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 away and, and submit your views completing that Shall I, shall I say something uh, I wanted to, to yes, please, on, yeah. um, something that Catherine had said earlier on around uh, trust, getting people to trust the system. We are, we are uh, an older industry, we've been around for a hundred years or so. It's, you know, it's, it is something that's, that's there and that there's a lot of lessons that have been uh, baked into the way people uh, go around their jobs and, and their daily practices. And um, I think trying to change that culture, and, and as you mentioned earlier on, boil the ocean in one go, it's very, very, very difficult. So. Um, I think one of the things I mentioned earlier on was iterating and, and, and a way to try and uh, just start on that journey towards changing the culture and getting people to trust the new systems and the autonomous systems is by doing small iterations, getting people to just try things out, test things out and, and not say you are going to move to this system now, but you know, the inter in the interest of growth, let's, let's try testing this small widget and see how we can build that into our daily lives and our daily systems. And when you get people actually starting to use it, you can uh, you can uh, develop champions and, and people that then can be advocates for your own 
uh, your own innovations and your, your changes towards the autonomous system. And I think that's perhaps a, a really positive way that you can start to ingrain, uh, ingratiate change uh, across the whole system and all, all of the uh, employees that work at networks. We've, there's a, you know, they're very big organizations. It's very difficult to get uh, culture change just in, in, in one project. I think lots of little projects, lots of iterations that can help uh, feed into one another and build on one another is probably the way to go. Thank you, Dan. That's, that's key. I mean, that's the whole, I think, ethos, right, is innovate. Uh, and good thing there's funding for it, because as we know, regulated as they are, the networks, it's hard to tap into the BAU funding for some of the more risky projects, as we all very well know. Um, so kudos to the UKRI for helping us on that journey. <laughs> uh, Nico, not sure can, if the, if Nico, the can I just... Yeah, sorry, sorry, Lynn, go for it, yeah. Nico, just a flag, it's probably a common theme from across all the panellists, and it was just to emphasise that data will be intrinsic and is intrinsic to the energy revolution. Um, stakeholders and customers need data to support their choices uh, for their decarbonised future. Um, certainly market participants will need data to improve and create market services and, and innovation. And also we uh, as operators uh, and other uh, parties will require data to inform better investment decisions. But first and foremost, actually looking beyond investment and, and being positively disruptive in our own activities uh, to look at maximizing a smart, flexible energy system. So it, it's really just a call out to, to those on the call is that what you'll see across many of the utilities is opening up of data. Um, you're also seeing that collaboration through the Energy Networks Association. So it's really just a, an ask is tell us if that open data is useful. Please provide feedback or if there's other information that you need. Um, and certainly we'd be keen for you to support if you've got data that can help us. Um, so there's many innovation projects that are happening here and now. Um, there's one that UKIPA Networks are, are leading that I sponsor called Envision, where we're looking at how other data from other parties can support us to increase our visibility and understanding of what's connecting to the network. And, and certainly that's occurring with my other network colleagues. So it, it's really just a signpost. If you have data, please let us know. And second of all, if you need data, then look at the open data portals that everyone's sharing and, and tell us if that's going far enough or if we need to improve. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, uh, that's one of the ENA initiatives from my recollection uh, as part of the data energy digitalization. Is that correct, Daniel? Uh, just to, to help people understand that if they're not clued in. Yeah, there's a there's a number of data projects going on. So some of some of the DNOs are, are surfacing data through their own portals, and we're also looking at that centrally through ENA and how we might surface data there. So yeah, an ongoing initiative, and uh, the NESM is one of the first outputs of that. So I put the the um, launch event into the chat. So do come along. It's a free event. It's virtual, and you can find out more about what we're doing uh, with the NESM and other other data and digitalization projects. That's fantastic. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, you know, just to uh, wrap up here. Uh, first of all, thanks to the great speakers. Uh, it's been actually, I think we got more than I hoped for. Uh, I hope it was the same feeling shared by everyone, at least from the panel at the minimum and the rest of the participants. Uh, we try to decipher essentially what is that convergence of energy networks and advanced digital infrastructure towards the kind of greater intelligence within the network domain. And I think there's a lot of us, a, a lot of things we can take away, a lot of things we could all together work towards uh, collaboratively. I think that's for me the key takeaway. Obviously, you cannot do anything without data. And thank Lynn for, for making that point, especially towards the end. Um, so, from us at Digital Catapult and all the panelists here, thank you very much for staying tuned. Um, the panelists, if you like to stay uh, uh, after the panel closes, please uh, do stay. And for the rest of you, have a great week, a great day, and uh, looking forward to uh, joining us on that journey. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, and continue the discussions.